Okay. We uh, will continue with a couple of topics on uh, simple waves before we move on to the uh, vibration of a simple oscillator and, uh, and so on. Um, one thing that we want to talk about is sums of uh, harmonic functions. So if you have, uh, let's say, the same frequency, and uh, say, And their sum will be in exactly the same shape. Okay? A different amplitude, but uh, certainly has the same frequency dependence. Do you know if you can show this? Can you demonstrate that? You can by adding two functions together. This is not uh, as complicated as when they have different frequencies. Then we do have Before we go to it, let me just get back to this for a second. Now, when we say it looks like it's the same frequency, it does. It has, it has a single frequency with some shape. But uh, when you look at these two frequencies, okay, and the other one might be a waveform like this. And also what's important is where they start from. In this case, there's no phase lag introduced, but there can be. <laughs> okay, and they can give you very different shapes by changing the uh, phi visually when you look at it in time domain. Okay, and it could look very complicated. But the bottom line is because these are linear uh, summations, their sum will consist of <clears throat> two frequencies. Now, what we want to uh, remember here is if the difference between them is very small, okay, if omega 1 and omega 2 are close to each other, what happens then? You know it, but they don't know probably. What happens if the frequencies are very close to each other? Oh good, something you don't know that I can teach you, finally. You knew everything. Beats. Beats will develop, okay? Let me explain what that means. If, uh, if we say omega one is omega minus delta omega and omega two is just a little bit over. And delta omega is just a very small number. <laughs> okay? Now, if you add these two frequencies, this, their sum, okay, If you expand the uh, cosine expressions, like uh, 
and collect the like terms together, the sum will be Exact. I'm sorry about this amplitude. Without the amplitudes, just to show if A1 and A2 are 1, you would have an amplitude like this. And what does this show? Um, Okay. When the two frequencies are very close together, you will have a signal that looks like this. And these are called beats, two frequencies very close together. <laughs> and essentially, it's a modulation of the amplitude by delta omega. In some ways, you can think of this as part of the amplitude of the signal. Okay? So you can say 2 cosine delta omega t. So you have the signal, the original signal, but its amplitude also changes very slowly with time. Okay? And this is called the beat phenomenon. <laughs> so if we had two loudspeakers here, you could hear as mmm, mmm, okay. Engines in airplanes, once in a while, if, they, if they're slightly out of sync, you can hear that loud and slow, very low frequency sound, amplitude modulation. There's one other topic that's called heterodyning. And this is, this is a technique that used to be used in uh, uh, signal analysis in acoustics. And what it does is uh, by squaring squaring the sums of two signals, produces sum and difference of frequencies. And uh, let me show you how. Okay, if we have two signals, we sum them, but now we square them. And these, these used to be and are done electronically. And uh, what this does is, of course, if you Once again, if we use the uh, geometric relationship, um, okay, if we expand both of those, then uh, we do end up with 
Um, And uh, you can see the summation, uh, the squaring here leads to sums and uh, uh, differences of, um, of two frequencies. These are used in extracting information from uh, different types of events. I think they're used in uh, optoelectronics and, uh, and uh, some other uh, f uh, physical experiments probably more so than acoustics nowadays. OK, I think we're pretty much done with the uh, harmonic function expressions. Now let's see if we can start applying these to linear oscillators, simple vibrating systems and displacement acceleration forces energy concepts, because the same, exactly the same concept will be used in sound waves. Okay, so if we understand these quite well and uh, the fundamentals behind them, then it will be a lot easier to understand the, uh, understand the uh, same concepts in uh, sound waves. Okay. Okay, linear oscillators. I'll draw here two sketches. One is just a simple oscillator, a mass attached to a spring with a spring constant K. And so if from equilibrium we give it a disturbance, it will oscillate forever because theoretically, ideally, this has no losses, okay? And another expression would be, or another uh, form of this would be, in this case, we have what's called the viscous dash pot, okay? It represents uh, basically uh, damping and energy absorption mechanism. But even a better one may be when you have friction. Okay, that again is another uh, mechanism to provide resistance to motion. It always acts against the motion, thereby it converts some of the energy into uh, thermal energy, heat, meaning it dissipates, gets away from the system. Okay, so keep these in mind, and uh, we'll start with uh, writing the uh, equations of motion. Earlier, uh, we described displacement Okay, a harmonic motion. Acceleration, zeta means, is the uh, displacement itself. Okay, so we said the acceleration and uh, omega zero is the uh, natural frequency, which is a square root of the uh, uh, ratio of stiffness to mass. So. What we do is write the general solution. Now, the general solution has uh, cosine omega t term and a sine omega t term. 
Both of these are solutions to this. <laughs> to make sure that general solution, these two uh, uh, are independent, they must be orthogonal, right? <laughs> the two solutions must be orthogonal. Otherwise, they cannot be there. They would convert into one. What does orthogonal mean? Their integral over a time period must be equal to zero. So that means from zero to t sine omega t cosine omega t dt. And that's case. Okay? If you integrate them, that will be the case. So they're orthogonal. So the general solution then we can write it as uh, C cosine omega t plus S sine omega t. <laughs> and C and S are constant. And where do we find their values from? From? No. Initial conditions, okay. Boundary is spatial. Initial conditions in terms of time. So um, if we say the, uh, at time zero, the initial condition is um, given by zeta zero, that would be equal to C. And similarly, we can write um, And that would be given by uh, omega zero. Yeah. OK, sorry, these are all omega zero because it's a natural frequency. There is no forcing involved. These are all in terms of the natural frequency of the system. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with these, but I can actually say A cosine some number phi. I can say this constant is equal to this constant. This is a constant. My choice. Okay? And similarly, I can say this is A times sine phi. Okay? <laughs> when you do that, what you're able to do is collapse this into a simpler expression. Okay, and what is phi? You can see it's the ratio of the initial conditions or So the general solution for free vibrations of a linear oscillator is uh, given by a harmonic uh, equation. And we can say here that motion is uniquely defined. by the uh, initial conditions. All right. Now, the uh, We want to follow this by oops, by suggesting an 
Another definition, compliance is inverse of stiffness. Okay? Now, compliance is inverse of stiffness. So, uh, using that, if you have, let's say, multiple springs, You have multiple springs attached to an oscillator as it moves up and down. They have one thing in common. That's a deflection. They all have the same deflection. Okay? So if they, they all have the same deflection, then the uh, effective stiffness will be sum of all the stiffnesses. All right? And uh, effective stiffness will be larger than any single one of them. So, in some ways, uh, we'd say it is a, it's a harder spring. <laughs> okay. So, if you add them in parallel, these are. On the other hand, if you have a number of them connected in series. <laughs> now, what is common here? We said What's common in the uh, parallel cases, they all have the same displacement. What is parallel here? Uh, yeah, what's common here in the series? Force. Exactly. The force will be all common. If the force is all common, then uh, what we say is the effective compliance is a sum of all the compliances. And in this case, of course, K effective is 1 over C, and K effective is smaller than the individual ones, and it's a softer spring, more compliant. When you add many of them. So the net effect is... Uh, uh, much softer than all the other ones. Now let's extend this concept to acoustics. Or I should say sound in, uh, in a tube. Let's consider a tube, okay, close at the bottom, open at the top, and we have a plug, a cylinder, okay, cross-sectional area is A, length is L, volume is A times L. Okay, so you can imagine it's almost like a balloon, but of course balloon expands on the sides. So here you have a plug. If you push it down and let it go, assuming there are really very negligible leaks on the side or not, it will oscillate. Okay, that's an oscillator. Let's see if we can uh, define how that might happen. That means if it's oscillating, uh, number one, <laughs> What do you have to have? Number one, you must have a mass, which we do. The next thing is a stiffness. Stiffness of what? It would be the air column. 
So we want to find out what the stiffness of the air column is. So it will look like it's very similar to the earlier equations that uh, we have driven. So we call this the air spring. Now, just for your notes, uh, if the uh, system is isothermal, of course, the, uh, we have pressure times volume would be constant, okay, if it's isothermal. But if it's isentropic and adiabatic, And what this, of course, means is uh, constant entropy. That means uh, reversible energy input and out are reversible, so you're not losing anything into uh, into uh, entropy. And in that case, um, let's see. Uh, this gives the P over P as minus. And in the isentropic case, um, where gamma is the ratio of the specific heats at constant pressure and constant temperature, a uh, volume, sorry, now for air under standard conditions, it's about 1.4 or 1.41. Okay. Now, give a small displacement to the mass. Okay, so we provide it with a downwards, a small displacement. What will it cause? It will cause a change in the volume, okay, volume of the air. <laughs> and that will be, how much will that be? What will be the volume change? Correct, but minus, okay? These are important because it's decreasing. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, volume change. Now that we know that, we go back here because we're interested in what the forces are, right? You know the force, you know the displacement, that gives you stiffness expression. So now that we have that, we say dp over P, right here, minus gamma. Okay, and from here, What we find is the pressure change on the inside. Oops, uh, make a mistake here. Okay. Um, let's leave it like this. Okay, because pressure is still here. So the force, force is uh, 
And uh, how do you find the stiffness of the column? How would you do that? Right. Say again. Right, right. Force divided by the displacement will give us the uh, Volume is and uh, of course, volume is uh, A times L. So you can see that stiffness is inversely proportional to the length. Or we can say compliance is proportional to the length. The longer the tube is, the more compliant it is, or less, less stiff uh, that would be. And the uh, piston uh, will oscillate okay, after release. Piston oscillates at its natural frequency, and the natural frequency in this case will be um, Write this down and let's just discuss it for a second. <clears throat> okay. Now, what this shows is this is an interesting thing. You can measure pressure, you know, cross sectional area of such a tube, its length, and you can measure the mass. Okay, so if you give a tap and watch the oscillations of a, of a plug like this, you can actually measure specific, the ratio of the uh, specific heats. Okay, very interesting. You're able to measure a thermodynamic quantity by a very simple oscillatory system. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It's very interesting. So. And this is a very simple example of use of acoustics or vibrations, oscillations, and so on. One thing to uh, uh, keep in mind is we would call this the fundamental frequency of the setup, okay? Meaning it's the lowest frequency. A tube like this has theoretically infinite number of natural frequencies, okay? So, uh, as you are excited, you will see the second mode twice, three times, four times, etc. And in some ways, um, this is also very similar to a, what's called a Helmholtz resonator, which we will get to in a little while. Bottle, you blow over it and it starts whistling, it resonates because you're exciting its natural frequency because you're moving a mass of air in this case, not a separate plug, but the air up and down, and then you're creating a resonant frequency. Any questions on these topics? Okay, let's, uh, let's continue with the uh, vibration problem and talk about the energy of vibrations, okay? <coughs> Thank you. 
The total energy, of course, is a sum of the uh, kinetic energy and the potential energy at any given time. Um, the uh, potential energy is a function of the uh, displacement at any time. And it is the uh, force times displacement, which then is Okay, so basically this is the force over an incremental distance. As we integrate them, we do get the uh, uh, potential energy. Hmm. Um. So similarly, the kinetic energy would be um, one half um, zeta dot velocity squared at any given point. So Starting with the uh, equation of motion here, just for a second, I want to show the constant values. Um, okay. If we multiply both sides of this by u, we have mu dot u plus k. U. Um, of course, U is the velocity. The whole point of this little exercise is from the equation of motion, you can start and show that the uh, total energy of the system is constant in this conservative system. Okay? Total energy is constant. So you start with the equation of motion, mass times acceleration, spring constant times displacement and by multiplying the velocity we have the second expression which can be written as time derivative of kinetic energy time derivative of potential energy and equation of motion is now written as time rate of change of kinetic energy which is equal to zero okay and that's all it says <laughs> so so totality. And uh, um, the, uh, when displacement reaches a maximum, velocity reaches a minimum, and vice versa. So one can actually uh, find a total energy as either the maximum kinetic energy or maximum potential energy. So total energy can be written as the max kinetic energy or maximum potential energy. Um, why 
what happens when there's a loss in the system? Okay. Um, uh, let's see, what do I want to call this? Um, when there is... Friction loss present. Okay, in the friction loss present, then the equation of motion becomes uh, No. Following exactly the same approach here, what we would have then is, uh, let's see, um, multiply by u. We have then t over d over dt of kinetic energy plus potential. Potential energy is equal to minus R U squared. What does this show you? Every equation you see, not only in this course, but every course, should tell you something, okay, explain something. We looked at here and we said, hmm. This is an expression for the total energy of the system at any given time, at any given position of the oscillator, kinetic energy and potential energy. Okay, this total energy. It's change with time is equal to zero, conservation of equation. Ah, uh, energy, conservation of energy. Now, when we look at here, okay, we have the same time rate of change of the total energy, but it's not zero. It's minus Ru squared. And so what does it say to us? Yes. And anything else? Go ahead. What it says is energy here is being drained at a rate minus Ru squared. Energy is decreasing. OK? And if it goes on, energy of this will be zero, it will stop moving. That's what it says. And so this is the loss. And it comes from where? From the uh, friction loss or damping loss, etc. Whatever losses you may have in the system, it makes it non-conservative, energy is not conserved, and energy is drained. And uh, in fact, what we can do is, uh, we can write the uh, uh, mean square of energy, average energy drain as, oops. So it's an exponential decay over time from the beginning. And uh, the oscillations, of course, no. will be, so it's, that's the, uh, that's the decay time. Okay. Um, How would we uh, describe the uh, oscillations of a system with losses? Call it the damped oscillator. Free oscillations. 
Free oscillations means there's no forcing function involved in the system. You give it some sort of excitation on some sort of initial displacement and the uh, consequent vibrations. So the equation of motion can be written as These are, you have seen these a few minutes ago. These are just the uh, summations. This is often called a damped natural frequency. And that's the damping ratio. And you can see here that it describes an oscillation also like this. So we have covered the free oscillations, how it looks like an acoustic system, and also we have covered the uh, damped oscillations. What we want to do next is going to be the uh, uh, use of uh, forced vibrations. I want to take a five minute break now and uh, get ourselves together. I think we might be able to finish all of this today. So.